Thanks, Nori. Uh, first of all, thanks to all of you. This is like the true believer crowd, you know? I mean, you, you stuck around the whole day, so uh, kudos. Um, so here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a, about a, a couple stories that were captured in a book I wrote uh, about 18 months ago with a very close friend of mine, Jeremy Nowak, uh, called The New Localism, How Cities Can Thrive in the Age of Populism. And basically, we wrote this book because we you know, woke up in November 2016, surprised to see that Donald Trump was president, and we just got really pissed off and, um, and said, okay, now what do we do? Well, if you're at Brookings, you write a book. I mean, it's not, you know. So, um, so this is the result. And, um, and, you know, we started with this notion, which was really captured today in so many of the sessions, that, that everything has changed, right? I mean, we're going through this period of demographic transition and technological innovation and economic restructuring and climate. You know, the U.S., it's, it's the largest income inequality since we've recorded that statistic. And, um, you know, this is the result, right? Um, the, and, and the result is, is not surprising in some respects because if you look back particularly at U.S. history, uh, when you have these periods of anxiety and social insecurity and hyper-nativism, you get populism of the wrong side. Uh, I won't even talk about what's going on in the UK, I'm sorry, but <laughs> talk about a crack up. But, um, you know, so this should not surprise us at some point because a lot was happening within our societies that we really were not paying attention to. Um, but, you know, sometimes when you wake up in the morning to the president's tweets and you get over that post-traumatic stress syndrome, I, I you know, you you're basically retaught because of the media focus that aren't our countries run from the center, right? And they're not. When you actually think about all these structural shifts underway in the world, what they've really done is diminish the role of the nation state and elevated the role of the city state for deep reasons. It's not just cyclical. It's not that certain people come into power or the national government is dysfunctional, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's that the role of cities and metropolitan areas have changed. And that's because cities and metropolitan areas are the centers of global trade and investment. Uh, they are the hubs of innovation and productivity. When you do that right, not just on the business demand side, but on the labor supply side, when you actually equip workers with the skills to participate in many of these advanced industries, you do have more economic opportunity. I'm not sure any of us are really doing that well yet. Uh, they're at the vanguard of diversity, a new kind of expansive vision of democracy. And when you grow cities with new energy bases, uh, new transportation systems, then they can begin to cure climate and adapt to climate, right? So cities are really at the center of the world. Um, and then the question becomes, where's the power, right? Because a lot of power in our countries are still locked up in older hierarchies, whether it's national governments, provincial governments, state governments, right? This book was about the shift of power. And not just governmental power, but market and civic power. And it was trying to put forward a notion that cities are not governments, right? National governments, provincial governments, they can be hijacked by partisanship and ideological polarization, and they often are. Cities are networks. They're, they're governments for sure, but they're also private sector leadership, philanthropic, university, community, environmental, labor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, they tend to be more pragmatic, they tend to be more practical, and they tend to be somewhat, not entirely immune to political upheaval and gyrations, but they are able to get through that. Um, so new localism, from our perspective, was a new governing philosophy for the 21st century, uh, and it was a way of solving problems. If the 20th century was top-down, national or provincial government-led, 
uh, siloed and stovepiped specialization. If you have a transportation problem, go find a Department of Transportation. The 21st century is more bottom-up. It's more networked. It's more interdisciplinary. And ideas travel along global circuits. Um, there may be an innovation happening, as I'll talk about in Copenhagen, that is more relevant to Toronto than anything going on in North America. So this is a different world that we live in, and we're still basically making the transition to an urban age or a metropolitan century. So when you're in an urban world, what you tend to look for are norms and models that can be captured and codified, maybe replicated, more likely to be adapted and adopted by other cities. When you're in a nation state world, you're looking for that piece of legislation, right? That regulation that might start in another country and then make its way over to your country. An urban world is different. We're not looking necessarily for laws. We're looking for norms and models. And we're looking for particularly network models that can cut across these different sectors and disciplines. So when Jeremy and I were writing this book, we were on the hunt for norms, particularly around new forms of growth, new forms of governance, and new forms of finance. And you know, we started with about 25, mostly European, US, we even had a few in Canada, and then we sort of narrowed it down to three. So I'm gonna just tell you three stories, the lessons that we took from those, and what they might mean for this country and your, in your cities. So with growth, we started with Pittsburgh. Um, now Pittsburgh today is a gorgeous city, right? I mean, if anyone, how many people have been to Pittsburgh? Okay, so quite a few, it's a gorgeous city. Um, this is what it looked like in the 1970s when it was the steel capital of the universe. Uh, my father's sister used to live in Steubenville, Ohio, which was part of the steel supply chain. So when I was about seven or eight years old, I would be sent by myself, by plane, this is before all that TSA stuff, um, to Pittsburgh and my aunt and uncle would pick me up and take me to Steubenville. And I could barely breathe, but other than that, it was great. I mean, you know, they had a, I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, so they had a country club, they had all these like chain restaurants. I thought I was like in America, actually. Um, so that was fun. And then, of course, all this collapsed, like literally overnight. And what our book basically says is that the beginning of the rebirth of Pittsburgh actually started with the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster, right? Because those facilities were owned by Pittsburgh corporations. And what those corporations began to look for were cheap ways, inexpensive ways, to both assess the damage of that nuclear disaster and then clean it up because when they first started thinking about it from a traditional engineering perspective, it would have cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and bankrupted the corporations. So they found this guy, who's still alive, named Red Whitaker. He was one of the first roboticists in the United States. He was teaching at Carnegie Mellon. And they asked him, could you figure out a way to assess the damage of Three Mile Island and then give us a set of solutions? So he was beginning to develop the early phase of autonomous vehicles, right, um, at Carnegie Mellon. And he was able to send in these uh, assessment tools uh, into the bowels of Three Mile Island. And basically, uh, for a million dollars, right, fairly inexpensive at the time, give them an assessment of the damage and give them a way forward. What was going on at Carnegie Mellon and was going on at the University of Pittsburgh is a naturally occurring innovation district. It's the 21st century way in which we innovate, not just around te technological products or processes, but really across the board. And that's because the spatial geography of the Oakland area of Pittsburgh is only about a quarter square mile. So if you think back to the 1970s, a lot of what corporations were doing we're putting their R&D centers far away from the downtowns, right? Keep your secret secret. This is a different kind of geography. This is a geography where you want advanced research institutions, mature companies, startup scale-ups, incubators, accelerators, seed funding, angel, et cetera, to mash up, right? So Pittsburgh began to come back 
because of a particular kind of spatial geography and because of incredible investment from the philanthropic and corporate communities in the future. They, they realized steel was not coming back. So they began to invest in technologies, next generation technologies, some of which have enormous social impact, as we all know, right? Um, and they began to invest in technologies that they did not even have a name for. But, and they basically said, we'll invest in this stuff without any sense of whether we're gonna get a return. This is patient capital providing a platform. So if there's about 15 technologies in the world, with, which in a short period of time will be half of global GDP, depending on how they play out. Pittsburgh's in five of them. Five of them. And that's because they basically went, as I'll talk about before, from very quickly, from being a rust belt to being a brain belt. They understood the shift, and they also understood that half of the jobs in these advanced industry sectors, fueled by next generation technologies, are occupied by people who don't have four-year degrees, they have credentials. So they were betting on the future, both as a way to have an innovative growth policy, but also an inclusive growth policy. Pittsburgh's a new city. You know, if you want to have a great meal in Pittsburgh, uh, you know, not hard to find, incredible amenities. But these companies, remember the Amazon Bake Off, right? You know, everyone just throwing money at Amazon to show up. These companies are sending their R&D labs to Pittsburgh, not because anyone's giving them tax incentives, because they have to be near the secret sauce. They need to be near smart faculty, smart students, and this whole sort of feeder system of uh, workforce development um, that enables more and more people to participate. So a city has to think like a system and act like an entrepreneur. Right? National governments, state governments, they think in silos. Right? That's the mid 20th century model. Literally fortified stovepipes. We have a department of this and a department of that. Right? Occasionally they talk about collaboration across agencies, but that's like an unnatural act between non consenting adults. Let's just be real. Okay? Cities think across. Right? They think horizontally, they don't think vertically. And they act like an entrepreneur. They take risks uh, because they're networks. So you have philanthropies or others who literally are putting money on the table that they don't know whether it'll have the right kind of a, they're experimenting, they're innovating constantly. Couple other lessons, as I said before, they went to being a brain belt. And to be a brain belt is not just to get a doctorate from Carnegie Mellon. It's to push down knowledge literally into pre-K through 20, right? It's to push it as far down into your system as you possibly can, particularly as you're going through demographic transition. You know, Pittsburgh used to make things. They still make things. They don't have the same value of employment, obviously, but they still make things. And they have that focus on product design and constant product innovation and problem solving. And philanthropy has basically invested their capital back into their city. If you think about where wealth is in the world today, right, a lot of people will talk about, well, it's in Silicon Valley, it's in Boston, it's in New York, it's in Toronto. Well, where's that wealth coming from? A lot of that's coming from philanthropies and universities and pension funds and high net worth individuals who take their capital, put it in a hedge fund, put it in a private equity firm, put it in a venture capital firm, and then send it to the alpha cities. Pittsburgh took their wealth and began to reinvest it locally. That's a 21st century capital flow. Actually, it was a mid 20th century capital flow before we financialized the world. So very important to think about Pittsburgh as a growth model. Indianapolis, how many people have been to Indianapolis? So, a few less. Okay, so mid-70s, this was your typical American downtown. We had decentralized our population and our jobs. We had sprawled out, courtesy of the national government, subsidized roads, infrastructure, all the rest of it. This was a dead downtown. So the exciting stuff people would do, men, I don't think women were involved in this, go down to the downtown with shotguns and shoot at pigeons. And so that was the exciting stuff in Indianapolis. 
And Kurt Vonnegut, anyone remember Kurt Vonnegut? Great surrealist novelist from the 1960s and 70s. He grew up in Indianapolis. That probably affected his head, you know what I mean? And he basically said, this was a city for 364 days. You played miniature golf. The last day you went to the Indianapolis Speedway. This was a boring place. So the business, political, civic, and university leaders began to come up with a scheme to restore the core. If you don't have a heart, you don't have a city. You don't have a metro. Their scheme in the 1970s was to become the amateur sports capital center of the United States because the Olympics were becoming more professionalized. So they started building stadiums, literally, for everything, facilities for everything. They went out in the middle of the night, literally in the middle of the night, they sent trucks to Baltimore, stole the football team, American football, from Baltimore, took it to Indianapolis, and then in the late 1990s, they went to Kansas City and stole the NCAA, right, which is our, you know, basically college basketball, right? So they became very good at stealing sports teams. They were like the John Dillinger of cities, right? And at some point, and John Dillinger was from Indiana, so I think it's somewhat in the DNA, right? So they, at some point, they basically said, um, how much beer and hot dogs can we consume, right? That's not an advanced economy. We know the jobs that are associated with sports. So they decided to go from basketball to biotech. Because when you look at the central Indiana economy, what it is really good at is biotech, life sciences, and medical devices. So they began to move to a high road economy. And the way they thought about this was they took this Indiana Sports Corporation, which is the way the public, private, and civic leaders made decisions about which sports teams to steal and which facilities to build, and they built something called the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership. And the CICP was a network of CEOs from these different sectors who basically were there to steer and steward their life science economy. In the United States today, the number one exporter of life science products is the state of California. The second is the state of Indiana. And they began to invest in all aspects of life sciences. Obviously the R&D, obviously the commercialization of research, obviously investment in startup companies or scale-up companies, but then in logistics, and then in workforce development for a broad segment of the labor force. They decided basically to, as much as they possibly could, own this part of the economy. And others would dabble, and others, frankly, like Houston or Philadelphia or Cleveland or Boston or San Francisco, had better hospitals and better universities, but they took what they had and they became the best 21st century version of themselves. And a lot of private capital from corporations and philanthropies were put into startup funds and scale-up funds and research instead of going out to the coast. Right? And they actually built the Biosciences Research Institute in Indianapolis and then went around the world and started stealing faculty. So they never got rid of stealing stuff. They just went from sports teams to smart people. So be an ecosystem rather than an ecosystem. When you think about networks, whether they're at the city or metro level, the grass tops, whether at the neighborhood level, the grass roots, everyone's got an ego. Right? You walk into a room, I run this big corporation, I run whatever the hell people say. When you walk in that room, you're there to collaborate, to compete. Right? You're there to problem solve together in the service of your community. So they've created some mechanics of collaboration. When they meet, they meet to decide rather than discuss. And they have capital to deploy. They operate at the district level, the city level, the metro level, and the state level. They're very smart politically. I was up in South Bend, Indiana with Mayor Pete about two years ago and the head of Notre Dame. And they said to, to me and my colleague, we're part of the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership. I said, how do you figure that one out? You're in Northwest Indiana. Oh, well, because we do big data analytics. And they came up here and they said, you've got to be part of this because we need basically health tech, digital sciences to, to leverage what we have.
And finally, they're organizing private and civic wealth. Capital is not the problem. Capital's not the problem. Organizing capital is the challenge, right? This city, this metro, this state is organizing capital in a very, very focused way. Last lesson is Copenhagen. Now, raise your hand if you've been to Copenhagen. These are the cyclists. Okay. So, Copenhagen, amazing place, right? 600,000 people. I think actually 62% of people are biking or walking to school. I mean, or, or biking to school or work. I mean, this is unbelievable, right? Um, and, you know, Copenhagen's a very powerful local government. Because unlike the cartoon of the Nordics, a lot of the powers would push down to the cities and metropolitan areas. But 30 years ago, Copenhagen was on its back. 18% unemployment, industry had left, the port had moved over to Malmo, the place was essentially fiscally bankrupt. And what the leaders of the city and the country, because it's the capital city of Denmark, sat and talked about is a, we better do something big, and B, we can't tax anyone, okay? Time to start thinking. So what they came up with was a scheme to essentially leverage the land and the buildings that the public sector owned, both between the airport and the downtown, the Orestad district, and then along the entire harbor. First, what they had to do is they had to merge a bunch of public entities to ultimately create the Copenhagen City and Port Development Corporation, responsible for 50%, 5-0% of the redevelopment of Copenhagen over the last 30 years. And then they went into these different areas of the city, of the harbor and this area near the airport, North Harbor, Orestad, and they said, here's the deal. We're going to regenerate these places. We're going to lease land for residential, for commercial, for office, for a whole range of purposes. And the revenue from those leases are going to service the debt on a 21st century subway system. We're not going to tax anyone a kroner to build out our subway system. We're going to do it all by realizing the value of land, create the value, capture the value, and then deploy the value for the public benefit. And that's what they've done. If you're like me and you don't want to bike in Copenhagen because you figure like a five-year-old's going to run over you, which they do, um, you take the subway, right? It's an incredible system, it's reliable, it's frequent, and it's paid for by the smart understanding that value capture in cities like Copenhagen or Hamburg, or Amsterdam, or Toronto are the ways to finance a lot of what we need around infrastructure and around housing. I mean, in the end of it, it's not that complicated, but it's not the way North American cities and metropolitan areas have operated. So lessons for Copenhagen. This is the former mayor who became the head of the Copenhagen City and Port Corporation. We're not there for the quick fix. They're there for the long haul. These people think in 50-year terms. U.S., you know, when we think about our public assets, it's a fire sale. Oh, we got a budget gap this year. Sell that, sell that, sell that. What's the price? I don't know, sell it, right? These folks are there for the long haul. Other lessons. Copenhagen knew what land they owned. I guarantee you any American city does not know what the government owns even though it's probably about a quarter of the real estate in the city, because it's, it's fragmented across general purpose government, county government, state government, maybe the feds, depending on where you are, the port authority, the airport authority, the convention center authority, the state authority, the redevelopment authority, the parking garage authority, where really all the power is, right? I mean, we don't know what we own in the U.S. in the public. We don't know what the value of it and we don't have a plan for disposition. Other than that, we're in great shape, right? Um, they merge public entities, remember all that fragmentation? God forbid any of these authorities work with each other. And they think about public-private institutions. We think about public-private transactions. PPPs, we're doing deals, they're remaking cities. 
We need to get our act together. I mean, this is the way for the major cities of the world and for the next tier of medium-sized cities in our metropolitan areas to basically finance off of smart disposition of assets. So how do you create a nation of problem solvers? Um, minor problem. For every Pittsburgh, we have dozens of cities in the U.S. that can't wait to subsidize that billionaire owner of a sports team to build another stadium as opposed to investing in innovation and inclusion. Every Indianapolis, you know, we have lots of collaboration, but it's informal, it's in structured, unstructured. It's not funded, right? And so you have you know, bilateral or trilateral, let's do this initiative together, or let's do that initiative together. They're doing this in seriatim in Indianapolis, evidence-driven, data-driven, kept accountable, and again, they're deploying capital constantly on where they have either liabilities, challenges, or opportunities. And again, Copenhagen, they basically are leveraging public wealth, not private wealth. The private sector is doing fine in Copenhagen. Go visit Copenhagen. They're very wealthy. But the public sector, knowing that they've built the infrastructure, is getting a participation, right? They're, they're an investor. They're getting an equity takeout. And it just, it's the gift that keeps on giving. It just keeps rolling. They just keep servicing the debt on that 21st century subway. So I think we have to build a new class of city and metropolitan leaders who get what it means to govern in the 21st century. We're still transitioning, literally, from the middle of a different century that was big government, big labor, big corporation. This is a distributed world. It's a network world. And cities should be the place where they're agile, nimble enough to make the transition. So at the end of the day, it's not that complicated to sort of sort out what a network needs to know and then needs to act on. I mean, what's your edge in the global economy? I mean, I spend most of my time these days in the heartland of the United States and small and medium-sized cities that have lost their raison d'etre, right? Because their capital has been exported to the coast, they have not invested in themselves, and because their industries have been decimated, right? But they still have an edge. Dozens of cities in the United States and metropolitan areas still have an edge. But you just can't say, we're going to be the next Silicon Valley. You've really got to build from what is authentic and what is true. Who's in charge? You know, everyone thinks, you know, when because of, you know, mayors rule the world kind of theory. And Ben Barber was a friend of mine. But, yeah, mayors are in charge, elected officials are in charge, and a whole bunch of other people are in charge. At the city level, at the metro level, at the neighborhood level, right? I mean, this is a networks basically distribute power. The question is whether we can animate it and unlock it and have it connect to each other. <clears throat> and last bit is where is the power? The power is distributed across multiple kinds of institutions and intermediaries. It's not just in government. And government is essential. It's a platform. It's a foundation. Uh, don't try to rule without government. We've been trying it in the United States for the last uh, three years. <laughs> Guess how well that's going. But, it, you know, it, it, it has to be essentially a collaborative act, and to the greatest extent that it's coordinated and capitalized, all the better. So that's the new localism, right? Uh, I don't think it's a fad. I don't think, you know, if the Democrats in the United States win back the, you know, the White House and run the table and win the House and the Senate, suddenly, oh, we were just kidding. We're going back to national rule. What the hell does that mean in the 21st century, right? This is the way the 21st century is going to function. In many respects, the notion, the old notion that national government is at the top of the pyramid and then you have the provinces and states and then at the low level, you know, the children, the cities, the counties, the municipality. We got to flip the pyramid. Cities are at the top. Metropolitan areas are at the top of the pyramid. National government, provincial governments, they represent us, they're there to serve us, enable us, 
make all these different parts of our countries realize their fullest, greatest potential. That's the new localism. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Bruce. So, I'll explain to you quickly what's going to happen next. Um, we're going to have Councillor Wong Tam come up on stage, and uh, she's going to have about five minutes just to provide a response and some thoughts based on what you've shared, Bruce. Uh, and then the opportunity is for all of you in the audience to ask some questions. The way you can do that is if you open up the Event Mobi app, and if you go to the session, this session in the program, at the bottom you'll see a prompt that says, ask a question. You could put your question in there, and if you don't have a question, you can still go in there and upvote other questions. Some of those questions will be picked, and uh, Councillor and Bruce will be able to talk about them over the next little while. So with that said, um, we are very pleased to welcome Councillor Kristen Wong Tam to the stage. Uh, she represents War 13 when, and was first elected in 2010. Her contributions have led to the development and support of improved social planning programs, new affordable housing, innovative economic development programs, community art projects, and investments in diverse, family-friendly neighborhood planning. Thank you for being, us, being with us here today, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was amazing, amazing speech um, and uh, some remarks from Bruce. I think uh, there's just so much that was going through my head as you were speaking and I was taking down some notes. Um, and uh, one thing that really struck me was uh, around the model of new uh, localism, I would say, uh, was the, the final analogy that you, you discussed about um, that perhaps the national government is the parent. Uh, somewhere in the middle you've got the state, and in our case we've got the provinces, and then we've got the kids, the, the, the cities. And, uh, and then I think about the fact that our, our city, in particular, has had some meddling from the provincial government. And, uh, and oftentimes we talk at the city of Toronto about not having enough powers. Um, and of course the powers also represent uh, our collection of wealth, how we distribute the wealth, how we uh, buy services. And, uh, and most recently we've had some conversation in the city of Toronto on how to take back this power. Uh, specifically what you talk about. But we need a mechanism to do so. And I, as, I, as I hear your, your remarks about how it can be done through this network of, uh, uh, this new model of, of network and perhaps uh, uh, sort of seeing ourselves in this clustering effect, I still cannot help but feel like we still don't have the power yet. And perhaps it's because it's right on the tail end of the 2018 municipal election. Uh, for those who are from, uh, who paid attention to the city election in the city of Toronto, Torontonians, I know you, kn you knew what went down, um, but for those who are coming from outside and abroad, um, we, had a, we had our election uh, interfered with by the provincial government, uh, just to jog everyone's memory. And uh, in the middle of the election, our city council was sort of cut into half. Um, so that didn't feel like we were in a place of power. We certainly didn't feel like we were leading from a position of strength and you couldn't lead from the, from the front because literally we were being beaten up from the back. Um, and, uh, and so one of the, the new, uh, new thinkings uh, that's emerging now is how to develop ourselves into a charter city where we actually uh, pull our way uh, from the, the province as a, as a creation of, of them, but rather have a direct constitutionally um, uh, st stipulated uh, status that will give us much more control over the matters that, uh, that, that govern our affairs. Everything from taxation and revenues uh, to how, uh, what type of services that we would renegotiate with the other orders of government on who should deliver it, how we should deliver it. Uh, we should be able to define for us the model of governance, how we communicate with our communities and so forth and so forth. And all this was launched under the, uh, the banner of em Empower uh, TO. That's the, the sort of, um, affectionate moniker that we give ourselves. And, uh, and that t the, the, the city charter, um, I would say, would probably have to be somewhere, I would propose, in the mix of what you've just discussed, uh, because we don't have the power necessarily on our own. And I'd love to be proven wrong if it can simply be done through this extraordinary network of community uh, leadership, uh, some civic thought leaders, uh, the philanthropists in the communities and then local government, if that was all it took, I would say we probably have some of those incredible anchors 
assets that are already there. Uh, but unfortunately, I think we've seen that it's not probably not going to be enough uh, for the city of Toronto. Uh, the city of Toronto also is a is a is a sizable city. Um, and when I hear about you comparing um, the successes of Pittsburgh, uh, they have a population of 300,000. Uh, Copenhagen has 700,000. Toronto has about three million, and, uh, and and over seven million soon to be in the in the Greater Toronto Horseshoe area. Um, so I wonder if we've actually become too big to become that sort of nimble network. Because oftentimes, when you are very large and you are very popular, your population is as diverse as ours, uh, and we're very aware of our our diversity. Um, does that mean that we don't necessarily get to adapt to this new model as, as easily, perhaps, as a, as a city that's smaller, that's more nimble, that is uh, uh, more connected? Um, and then, of course, it's hard to talk about power and community wealth, I think, in the city of Toronto uh, without talking about money. Because so much of what we are looking for in the city is how to actually grow the economy, how to uh, bridge the income disparity as we see it across uh, the different vertical neighborhoods. Uh, we have people who are living in abject poverty. In my own ward in Toronto Centre, I have some neighborhoods where almost 70% of the children are living in poverty. And we know that it's not the children who are necessarily impoverished, it's actually the fact that they belong to uh, poor families. And those poor families are oftentimes uh, single women-led families, and most of the times they are re uh, racialized uh, and uh, and living in, in just uh, very harmful conditions. So, so being able to understand how do we harness the wealth collectively so we can distribute in a way that actually is going to grow um, would be something that I'd be very anxious in discussing. And there's some movement in the in the U.S. and we talked about this on the phone as we were getting ready to sort of prep this conversation, um, there's this, this concept about public banking. And for those who follow me uh, will know that I'm kind of keen on this particular tool. And recognizing that the state of California that has just signed into a law, the California Public Banking Act, which gives the powers to municipalities uh, to pursue uh, the, uh, the creation of a municipal-owned bank. Um, which then offsets the fact that they don't have to necessarily de deal with uh, de uh, debt service charges. Uh, all the tax receipts that they, they could lack would actually be deposited right into uh, the, the municipal-owned bank. Um, and now we have California, California who's, give, who's signed this into law. We now have San Francisco and LA who are pursuing that. Is this something that the city of Toronto should pursue, recognizing we have almost a $14 billion operating budget? and a over $40 million capital budget that we want to uh, also be able to address. And every year uh, we are going through this massive conversation and we will go through it very shortly in the city of Toronto on how to make sure we don't uh, hit that fiscal cliff. Um, so there's a lot of learnings as far as I can tell that's coming from the US and I'm really excited to dive into it uh, here. And hopefully you can shed some light, Bruce, um, and share with us uh, perhaps what you've seen uh, in Toronto that, uh, that you think would work here based on your studies and your research abroad? So I, I think those are really excellent comments. And I, I, I do think what we need in the world today is a mix of devolution and evolution, mm. right? So uh, too much power is still he held at higher levels of government. In our country, in your country, Definitely in Britain, uh, uh, you know, um, where all the power is really held by Whitehall. Um, the Danish example is interesting because so much of the power in Denmark or in Scandinavia generally is pushed down to the cities. Uh, and then these cities are able to pull talent from their universities, which are free. I mean, <laughs> unlike the United States in particular. So Even here. Yeah, so it's not surprising that there's enormous capacity in Scandinavia and to some extent within the Netherlands and Germany to, to really tackle the hard issues um, of today and of tomorrow. So the question is, will higher level of government give up the power, right? And I think for cities, the only way to really have a shot, first to stop the meddling, do no harm, and second to actually enable more, 
is to, is to form a very strong political consortium with your suburbs. Now, that's complicated because of the political divide. That's what's happened in Denver over multiple decades, where cities and counties, de Democrats and Republicans, came together to push the state house for more permission, more enabling, more empowerment. Um, I don't think there's probably any other path than political mobilization. But at the same time as we're shooting for devolution, we've got to evolve new kind of institutions. And I think what we were trying to put forward in this book was either public-private, private-public, or private-civic intermediaries that are well capitalized, have capacity, and have community standing have got to be built. Those are 21st century institutions. For the most part, we don't have them in most of our, in, in North America, but they do have them in North, Northern Europe and they have them in Singapore and elsewhere. Public banking, absolutely. I think that's the good populism. <laughs> There's bad populism, which is mostly about exploiting grievance um, or doing idiotic things by putting, you know, whether you should be in the European Union to a vote. And then there's, you know, good, uh, you know, um, good populism, so, which comes from the early part of the 20th century. And North Dakota, you know, has a public bank. I mean, there are examples that exist in the U.S. and elsewhere. So I think power is no longer just governmental. I think it now extends to market and civic power. And we need to find new ways of unlocking that and unleashing that. And, and how would we actually govern this, this new model, these networks? Because I think that sometimes we, we, we get into conversations about public-private partnerships, that's what we call them right. here. Um, and, uh, and sometimes they, they seem to be driven by private interests, uh, oftentimes uh, at the expense of the public good. So therefore, the cost of borrowing, the cost of doing, uh, ends up being a lot more and uh, we're being told that, uh, don't worry, you've transferred the risk over to the private cor corporation that can absorb it, um, but how do we govern this, this new network? I, I think we really have to think in terms of institutions. Mm -hmm. I, I think both of our cultures and the British think in terms of deals, transactions, and that's where we think about this risk transfer. But, you know, I'm in, I'm in Philadelphia with Drexel. We have something that's been around for 60 years, it's called the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation. There's a board of about 17 people. Nine are appointed by the business chamber. Eight are appointed by the government. And it actually, it acts essentially as a community lender around small business, concessionary capital, but also as a developer of large scale public assets like the Navy Yard in Philadelphia. So that's an old model, actually, that has existed for 60 years in Philadelphia. Like, who knew, right? I mean, uh, that they would have like a 21st century kind of model built in the 50s. We need more of these. So I think, I think transactions are different than institutions. And we need to think more about institutions, about how the public captures more of the value that they're creating through smart infrastructure and other moves. We're, we're allowing most of the wealth to be privatized in our countries. We have to have a different deal, so to speak, a different negotiation, a different balance between the public and the private. And when we're talking about private dollars, oftentimes we find that those private dollars come from, uh, uh, interestingly enough, pun uh, public pension funds, right. private equity funds, uh, hedge funds, and, uh, and oftentimes those are the, the, the ways these uh, private pro partnerships are being capitalized. Um, but we don't necessarily know where, where those monies are coming from, uh, and sometimes those, those funds uh, are, are doing naughty things uh, somewhere else, whether they're investing in, uh, in climate negative projects, they are pillaging the land, they're uprooting indigenous communities, they can be uh, supporting uh, oppressive regimes that violate human rights, and yet they can also be in Canada, uh, in, in Toronto, getting involved with us in private-public partnerships. So we, they are doing something over there and not necessarily disclosing all of that here. And when we take a look at their, their corporate mission statements, uh, there's usually you know, a, a really friendly looking page uh, on their website that says, we're doing good things. Um, but there isn't, a, there isn't full disclosure. So how do we know we're actually gonna be doing good work with good people, good institution, good philanthropists, 
all the time. That's going to be consistent with our values. So I, I think this is a, another, it's a, another great question. I think if we go back to the 1970s in the United States to combat redlining uh, by financial institutions, we put in place the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. We required every depository institution in the United States to disclose where they lent, right, because we wanted to see racial and ethnic disparities. And then we had a Community Reinvestment Act which basically said to banks, if they want to merge, they need to score well, right, in terms of their lending uh, in disinvested neighborhoods, right? We need essentially a new kind of disclosure in mature economies. We've got on one hand, we need to look at anchor institutions, pension funds, local anchors essentially, pension funds, universities, philanthropies. Where are you investing? Are you investing and exporting your capital, or are you investing back home, right? At the same time, we need to look at these large sources of institutional capital, like private equity and hedge funds, and go, no, we, we want a clear understanding of how you invest. And then everyone can make decisions based on full information. It's not for the government to dictate, you shall do this or that. Um, you know, obviously municipal governments can basically get out of investing in fossil fuel companies if they want, like New York City has done. But we need transparency in the market. And what we did with the banks in the 1970s, we now need to do with these other institutions. So that has to become the part of the next bigger, larger Community Reinvestment Act. Mm -hmm. And then cities like yourself will have the full disclosure. And do we wait until we get stricter regulations with those private funds before we actually get into this network? Or, or do we do it beforehand or, and we negotiate along the way? Um, I think if you're a powerful city like Toronto, you know, or New York, uh, or London, though I don't know post-Brexit what's happening in Britain anymore, but in any event, yeah. um, I, I think you probably can negotiate yourself with large financial institutions and basically say, if you're gonna do business in our city, this is what we want, this is what we expect, okay? And, but for many cities that are small or medium sized or suburban municipalities, may they may not have that power to negotiate with the market. So I think we need to move towards these uniform disclosure regimes at the national scale, or the provincial scale for that matter. But, um, and, and again, this is not about dictating to the market. You know, in the United States, pension funds, universities, and philanthropies gave, get favorable federal treatment in many respects. This is just a quid pro quo. Well, I guess you can't use the word quid pro quo anymore, but, you know, uh, but you, you, we got to get back to some sanity with our language here. But uh, I, I think there's a nexus for us to mandate disclosure. So when it comes to disclosure, and especially in terms of uh, getting into city building with corporations, um, it would probably be a, a missed opportunity if I don't talk about sidewalk labs. Yeah. And I know that you just had the opportunity to go down to yeah. Keyside. Uh, you you were, were given an opportunity to tour those 12 acres. Um, and, uh, and I would say that uh, in, in this case, uh, you talked about disclosure, you talked about sort of getting into um, a, an arrangement uh, where we can actually do good work together, build up civil society, build up infrastructure, build up neighborhoods, and, and, and sort of concentrate the wealth in the hands of both communities as well as uh, cities. Um, and yet we had a bit of a rocky start uh, to, uh, to that particular endeavor. Uh, and for those, I'm sure you guys have probably discussed this at this point, but just to recap, um, we're talking about 12 acres of publicly owned land right on the water's edge. Uh, Sidewalk Labs, who was coming in from New York, who really doesn't have a track record of delivering anything yet, um, but they wanted to uh, pitch that they should be given the development rights uh, over this, uh, this parcel of land. Um, and we got into a bit of a very public tussle. It was, uh, it was all over the media and, and communities came out, large and small, to talk about things such as data collection, governance. Um, they were, there were some demands about building infrastructure before they came in. Um, and and here was, a, here was a, a, a corporation that didn't own any of the land that were dictating the terms to the city of Toronto for over a year and a half. Um, and we are taking another step incrementally to, to do work with them. Um, 
did we make the right choice, or at least Waterfront Toronto? Council no. hasn't decided yet. Look, at the end of the day, I mean, you're not a, you're not a desperate city, right? So uh, you, you can strike a good deal. I could think of many cities in North America, if Google came to them, or anyone you know, of that ilk came, uh, just think about the Amazon Bake Off again. I mean, yeah. people would be throwing tax incentives at it. So I, I think you acted as a mature global city that basically said, we have values here that we do not want compromised. Um, now, from a broader perspective, you know, having a company like Google innovate around urban development on the energy side or the transportation side could be quite interesting, right? I mean, so on some levels, that disruption could be a good thing. It could get us quicker towards uh, cleaner, you know, renewable energy for portions of our city. But with regard to data and with regard to governance, you are absolutely right to basically say, we're not a cheap date, folks. You know, um, this is Toronto. I mean, we're a global city. So we, we need to negotiate as equals, as peers. And that's the power of cities as global markets, as the centers of trade and investment. Great, thank you. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. And, uh, and Bruce, are you ready to take a few of these? Sure. Okay, because I think uh, people really want to hear from you uh, furthermore. Um, so the first question is, does new localism focus on diffuse governance dilute democratic representation? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I actually think that representative democracy, uh, for all its benefits and all its drawbacks, is only one element of democracy. I think what, what where we're trying to pull, put forward in the new localism is a, is a sense of participatory democracy uh, at various levels, right? Whether, again, at this grass tops with anchor institutions investing back, um, both around skilled workers, around new companies, and at the neighborhood scale, right? So we're, this is playing out at multiple levels. And I think this is a broader participatory model of of, 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 of government and democracy, or governance and democracy. And representative democracy uh, needs, you know, needs some help here. I, I, you know, you, everything we're talking about, how provinces or states are meddling with their cities, means that representative democracy is really broken down. So we need participatory democracy within our boundaries, and then we need a new kind of collaboration with our neighbors so that we can go to the provinces and the states and hopefully the national governments and remind everyone, hello, you represent us. Enough of the nonsense, right? So the partisanship has, has really, in both of our societies, has just gotten completely out of control. And the only one who's gonna bring some order to this are the cities and metropolitan areas themselves. The parties will not cure themselves. They're, they're basically just energizing their bases. That's what they do. So the only one who's going to cure this are the cities and metros. And if we were to take a look at the institutions that you talk, sorry, the, the structures that you talk about, um, I can't help but think about some of it is around power. So uh, institutions can cluster around themselves and they have right. enough resources to, to sort of be able to concentrate that power. Cities certainly do have that if I were to think about the power of what city council can do. But local communities, uh, large and small in neighborhoods, uh, how do they negotiate with government as well as corporate institutions. Like, how, do, how does that work? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand this piece. Well, in the US, we have a new federal tax incentive. Uh, it's controversial um, because it gives people with capital gains the ability to reduce, defer, or even eliminate their capital gains taxes. So we have 8,762 opportunity zones. That's a few, right? Um, what we've been working with communities around the country is to create their own investment perspectives. What are your assets? What's the vision for a community? In most neighborhoods in the United States, what they want is, a, is, is going back to commercial nodes, that street corner, that commercial corridor, where there's authentic local, locally owned business or health clinics or community services in a concentrated node. So enabling those kinds of neighborhood 
visions, but that are very concrete and tangible uh, to be put forward, uh, gives them the ability to negotiate, not just with city government, but with the private sector yeah. uh, and with, with, with other sectors as well. That, that's fascinating. Um, what, one of the things that really came out of in our last federal election that we just went through uh, was the topic of climate change. And rarely is climate change yeah. one of the, the ballot box issues, but that happened for us um, in 2019. Can, can the new localism help us tackle climate change? And yeah, how? I, and how? I, I, again, and we can go back to Copenhagen. It's a beautiful place, but it's also the first major city in the world that's moving towards zero carbon emissions by 2025. So how do you do that? You change your energy mix, you know, uh, to wind, to solar, to geothermal, to district heating, to all of that, right? You get off of coal, you get off the dirty stuff, you drive energy efficiency in your buildings, you make transit and biking a feasible option for large portions of your citizenry, yada, 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 the technical term. So a lot of that is local. Yeah, it helps if you have a national government behind you or a province behind you. A lot of that is local. So we have a model out there uh, in Northern Europe of how a major city drives to zero carbon. Now the question is, can we adapt it to our own society? I think we can. That, that certainly seems like a logical move and probably a shift that the City of Toronto is already pursuing. Um, recognizing that uh, the City of Toronto is the most diverse city in the world, we actually pride ourselves on that. Uh, we have cultural ambassadors from around the world living, choosing this to be their home. Uh, we speak over 200 languages collectively. Um, and yet I also know that Toronto is not the only diverse city in the world. New York is standing up and saying, look at our diversity. Uh, you know, Rio de Janeiro is doing exactly the same thing. Every time I see an Olympic bid come forward, there's always every city putting forth their diversity. What are, what are the most inclusive cities uh, in the world? Can you give us an example of that? Like, Well, inclusion has multiple meanings. So I think the most inclusive cities are those places that are welcoming at the get-go, right? And I, I do think the Torontos of the world and the New York City's world are unbelievably inclusive from that perspective. Um, the challenge, frankly, in Northern Europe and other parts of the world is it's difficult to integrate and assimilate in the same way it is in the United States or in Canada. You know, in the US, you know, it, it's, it's despite Mr. Trump, despite the horrible rhetoric coming out of the White House. I mean, we're a country where, and you are as well, where the culture enables assimilation and integration. So inclusion at the get-go is about that. Getting beyond that, it's about schools and skills and entrepreneurship and capital. Um, whether it's new immigrants or whether it's existing populations, we've had a lot of extractive capitalism and parasitic capitalism for a long, long, long period of time. And so correcting that is not about rhetoric and not about culture, it's about capital. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one thing we're focusing a lot on in the US is how do we grow a system of community wealth where we have as a national or as a provincial or as a city or metropolitan goal growing businesses owned by people of color, 2x, 5x, 10x, within relatively short periods of time. Without equity capital, debt, subsidy, we're not, that ain't gonna happen. We need a different financial model here. So I don't think any city measures up to that, to tell you the truth. I think we're doing that threshold, can you come here or can you live here and be accepted and participate, right? But from a perspective of growing schools and skills and no, I don't think anyone is doing this well. And so we got to put our, we, we've got to invent a new system. The existing system is at the tail end. It doesn't work. I live in Philadelphia. 45% of our city is black. Two and a half percent of our city, uh, two, two and a half percent of the businesses in our city are owned by African Americans. Uh, Rutro. I mean, that's like a major problem, right? 
And that's not going to be solved with rhetoric. It's going to be solved with new kinds of intermediaries. Your community business conversation this morning was really interesting. This is a big task for us, and, and, and we should be inventing and co-inventing together. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the, the conversation about capital is fascinating, especially when you talk about the parasitic capital, um, perhaps even the predatory system of, of capitalism, uh, and sometimes the nature of it would, would, would be very uh, aggressive. And I think that when we were taking a look at cities competing to, to attract Google as a headquarter, yeah. um, their, their second headquarter, I should say, um, there was a lot of incentives thrown out, and you mentioned that in your remarks earlier. Does this mean that uh, cities who, who, who are chasing this capital sometimes have to run to the bottom uh, in order for them to succeed to get to the top? Yeah, I, I thought the Amazon bake-off was oh, absolutely Amazon, insane. Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, at the end of the day, it, it was pretty clear there were probably only five or seven places they were going to go. Now, it was a good thing for places probably to get their story and narrative together. But the Pittsburgh story or the Indianapolis story is about having the confidence to build on your distinctive assets and attributes and, and to be the best 21st century version of yourself and to keep buttressing and burnishing your authenticity. So. You know, the, the Amazon Bake Off was low road, 20th century, throw the kitchen sink and hope for the best. The high road is basically develop off your own base. And I, if, if folks want to ignore that, they can ignore it. It's a free country or countries. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a better way of doing this. And, and, and we have the skills and the intelligence and the resources to do it. Thank you very much, Bruce. I think that that was an illuminating uh, talk that you've given us. I think just an amazing uh, number of uh, remarks and insights. I think that uh, when when you showed me the image of uh, when you showed us the image of Pittsburgh, I think one of the things that I was I was dreading was that you had to hollow out as a city first. You literally had to see the collapse of your industry to then be reborn. I'm certainly hoping that that's not the path that <laughs> Toronto has to take in order for us to become this new, you know. Uh, super uh, city of the, of the future. Um, but I do think that there's, there's some things that you left us with, and I really want us to answer this, these questions as Torontonians. Um, and you asked, us, you asked the, the question, I think this, was, this might be a Toronto challenge, I want to finish this with, uh, with you. Um, and, uh, and so to our, our colleagues and friends and, and family here, uh, you know, this is a challenge for Toronto, and this one is, is from Bruce. Uh, what's our edge? Who's in charge? And where's our power? I think we need to figure out how to answer these questions, and then we're going to be on our way to this new localism. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.